You know, it might be fun to just kind of sit here and stare at you. And we're live. Um, how you doing? So, uh, I've got a reading for you today. I'm uh, inspired by a, a review that hit the other day and hanging out with uh, folks at the Lovecraft Film Festival over the course of the weekend. Um, I'm going to read you a story from Michael Griffin's The Lure of Devouring Light. I meant to practice this. I didn't. I hope I don't blow it. I'm a little inspired, too, because of S.T. Joshi's review of the book. Uh, and I'm just going to read you the money part right here, right now. Uh, Griffin's po pro... Bleh. Get that out of my mouth there. Griffin's prose is luminous, lapidary, and evocative. His gift for language is admirable, and his insight into human character is often penetrating and insightful. There is no question that Diamond Dust is one of the more powerful weird tales written in this new millennium. And that is according to uh, Lovecraft scholar and biographer S.T. Joshi. So that's pretty high praise. And uh, if you haven't checked out The Lure of Devouring Light yet, I would encourage you to do so. And uh, so I'm going to read you Diamond Dust by Michael Griffin. And... Uh, we're just going to rock into this. Max climbs in the echo chamber of the concrete stairwell. Every step, rhythmic time with earlier footfalls. Fifth story, one from home. Already a, tr a tickle of sweat under his arms. Maybe, maybe Cassandra won't be working tonight. Maybe for once he can relax. From the next landing above, an eruption of clangs and clatters. Two brutes barreling down, lugging an ungainly burden of welded steel. The massive constru construct shrieks against the metal rail and caroms into the outer wall, tearing a jagged trench in the concrete, pluming dust and scattering chips. Max covers his ears against the racket, hesitating. No way he can turn back in time. No way the twin hulks can stop their momentum. He flattens, flings his arms up to cover his skull. The avalanche of metal passes over. Jagged edges shred his suit, slicing skin. The thundering terror rounds the corner below. Max straightens, pulls together the torn jacket sleeve as if the edges, like, like a wound, might somehow heal. Max resumes his climb. Blood trickles from gashed forearms, drips from fingertips, leaving a trail to the sixth floor, home. Through the apartment door, the smoke alarm shrieks over the pulse of industrial music at nightclub volume. He enters, finds the entry hall billowing smoke, walls and ceiling dark with soot. In the living room, most of the carpet is burned away, the rest blackened. What color was it before? An area near the dining room, still smoldering, churns out eye-watering murk. Cassandra leans over a heavy steel plate, firing her plasma torch one-handed. Her denim shorts and tank top are shot through with pinhole burns, every one the aftermath of a spit of molten steel trajecting towards skin. No safety gear but a single glove and unleashed, unlaced steel toe boots. An afternoon wasted in daydreams of home, hopes of a quiet night. What was he thinking? When is this place ever quiet? Max disables the smoke alarm and stomps smoldering carpet. Cassandra's still cutting. He turns down Einstrasende Neubauten, a band he always loved, at least until Cassandra started blasting them every waking moment. Finally, she looks up. The cut form breaks free from the half-inch slab, clanks onto the pile. She kills the plasma cutter. Snatches a black smudged liquor bottle and swigs. Whiskey runs a rivulet from the corner of her mouth. Cuts a clean trail through ash-dark skin. She backhands it away. A delicate gesture that hints at what Max used to find appealing in her. What if they could clear away all the wreckage, the noise, just two of them again, like the beginning? He reaches for the fire extinguisher. Cassandra snatches it up first and gusts a chilly white cloud at his feet. 
Got tired of stomping to put it out, she shrugs, so I just let it burn. Stifling a cough, Max examined his bleeding forearm. I passed two guys on the stairs lugging a new sculpture of yours. Furniture, Cassandra glares. Why can't you respect my work just because it's avant-garde? It's furniture, not sculpture, not experiments. Max raises both hands and surrender. Just noticing you've been busy. This enormous piece I hadn't seen before. He tries to be discreet, scrutinizing her latest geometric absurdity, nothing but angles, sharp edges, all her earlier work's comfort and familiarity vanished. Same as their relationship. Cassandra loops a thick cable over her arm. I need patrons if we're ever going to rent a place of the workshop. She throws a blue tarp over her work, picks up the bottle and finishes it. Hope we make it before you burn the building down. Max says. Part of him wouldn't mind being rid of all this, being forced to start over. Take a quick drink of water. Keep going. By the way, peeking over my shoulder here. Original appearance of the story was in the Grim Scribes Puppets, edited by Joe Pulver. Um, highly recommended. So, back to the story. Max doesn't tell anyone of his obsession with the new neighbor because there's no good obsession. It's just that every morning on his way to work, no matter what time he leaves, Max glimpses the neighbor for only a split second. Most days, the neighbor disappears behind the adjacent front door. Sometimes the guy slips down the stairwell and vanishes by the time Max follows. Lately, Max thinks a lot about timing, the turn of the knob, the opening of the door. Better to hesitate or open right away. Whatever he chooses never makes any difference. It's become a game, maddeningly unwinnable. The neighbor, like a ghost, lingers just long enough to eliminate any doubt he's been seeing. Try not to think about it. Max resolves this morning. Just turn the knob. Open the door. Outside, perhaps six feet away, is the neighbor. He doesn't look surprised to see Max. The man stands there with his ordinary face, giving Max all the time he wants to look back. How could this have been something to obsess over? Max notices the man's right hand and arm, revealed by a short-sleeved dress shirt, are gruesomely scarred, disfigured by burns. The neighbor finally offers a nod. Max proceeds toward the elevator as he does every morning. Some robotic aspect of himself seeks the path easier than stairs, forgetting the elevator's broken. It's been broken for years. Some other part of Max reasserts control in time to redirect toward the stairs. Most days, Max spends the drive to work thinking about these two minds within himself. The part that day after seeks the elevator despite the, yeah, the part the day after seeks the elevator despite years of futility the lagging mechanism that recognizes only slowly stairs are his only option he drives the four miles to Portland's industrial district and finds the entire Boaz Industries parking lot replaced by acres of fresh poured concrete foundation tractors shift the earth cranes lift to hilt up walls in as far as the eye can see. This abrupt transformation is unexpected. Max's position in Boaz management making him privy to all upcoming projects. More than that, it's impossible. Weeks or months worth of construction labor completed in a single night's darkness. It would take a vast workforce, not to mention organizational planning of the kind normally handled by Max's own department. He's heard no mention of this, not a whisper. Am I the only one that's out of the loop? He wonders briefly, then extinguishes the thought. Implications too awful to consider. Many employee cars are parked along Lorraine Street, though not nearly enough for Boaz's 600 employees. Max finds an opening across from the abandoned brick factory. The return walk takes him past flashing lights, police cars, and ambulances surrounding three cloth-draped bodies on the median strip. Police officers regard him suspiciously. One scribbles Max's license plate number. The offices are so nearly vacant, Max checks his watch to make sure he hasn't mistakenly come in on a Saturday. 
A cluster of strangers murmur near the coffee dispensary. Others click away at desks. Overnight, the cubicle grid has been reduced by hundreds of workspaces, compressed into a much smaller area. The reclaimed area bordering the steelworks floor is blocked by an intimidating row of scaffolding covered in black fabric. Max finds his desk in the usual corner of the grid, near Mr. Boaz's office. At least this much hasn't changed. He's too distracted to focus on preparation for his early meeting. What's going on behind the black scaffold? Planned expansion? He should have been in the loop. Max commands his trembling hands to stop, clenches them into white-knuckled fists. Maxwell! Boaz pops in, too short to be seen approaching beyond the partition. Max jumps. Meeting still on, sir? He grips the seat of his chair with both hands. Always! Why wouldn't it be? Boaz plays the tips of square, stubby fingers against each other. No time for second-guessing, Maxwell. What's business without information? True, sir. Max concentrates on projecting a look of control while inside he churns. Surrounding cubicles, though outfitted with computers and expensive ergonomic chairs, remain vacant. He's alone in the planning department. Someone's making plans, just not Max or his team. Where are my people? It's after eight. Retasked. Special projects. Boaz looks down at his feet, despite the company's mandatory eye contact policy, his own initiative. Melt shop, most of them. Meeting at nine, as usual. Boaz spins, retreats to his office in a flurry of tiny steps. Hello, tiny dog. Though he doesn't know who will be attending, having seen none of the management group this morning but himself and Boaz, Max processes the usual 16 report copies. 23 minutes left, still alone in the cube grid, apart from a few milling strangers. Heart pounding, Max picks up the phone, dials Cassandra. Everything's changing here, he whispers. She exhales audibly. <sighs> yes? Construction. Staff reorg. All my guys gone. Max pauses. What is he called about? Max, I'm working. The guys in the stairwell yesterday trails off, aware she hates questions. She does this intentionally, overreacts so he'll never question her about anything. Last week, I saw those same two guys outside loading something big covered into a truck, maybe another of your, your furniture. I told you, patrons, they're taking several pieces. He regrets calling, but he's already interrupted her. I'm not going to tiptoe around this, Max catches himself his voice escalating in sudden urgency. The truck had a DRG logo. Our competition. Dino Resource Group. Boaz hates them. Hates. So if you're using steel, I bought you to make sculptures. Furniture. He grits his teeth. Furniture. With Boaz Steel. And selling it to Dino, which is Boaz's bitterest enemy. He wouldn't just be mad. I wouldn't just get yelled at or merely fired. Oh? Her amusement conveyed with perfect clarity. What would he do? Visions of the apartment ablaze, a wild, clashing inferno. Bodies gutted by the cronies Boaz hints at, but nobody ever sees. The two black and dead lying there, blood sizzling in ashes. She giggles. Max slams down the phone. On his way to the meeting... Max passes Boaz's office at the very moment another taller man emerges, preoccupied. Max doesn't register at first that the man's wearing short sleeves, forbidden at Boaz. Something familiar grabs his attention before Max is fully aware what it is. His neighbor. Those terrible burns. By the time Max looks back, the man's gone around the end of the cubicle row. Curiosity urges Max to follow, but there's no time. He races to the conference room, empty. He sits, waiting quietly, alone. Not here! Boaz stage whispers from the doorway. Max grabs the report packets and follows past empty cubicles, inactive document centers, a vacant break room. Near the edge of the construction scaffold, Boaz stops and opens a janitorial closet. What's this? Max hesitates, then enters the narrow supply closet. 
Boaz joins him and shuts the door. High shelves force Max into uncomfortable proximity with his boss. Boaz straddles an empty mop bucket. Max leans back against stacked toilet paper rolls, struggling to avoid encroaching on the man's personal space. Boaz loses balance and almost falls. Max steadies him by the jacket lapels, and Boaz ends up standing on Max's foot. This is the meeting? Max observes. This should be funny. So why this hollow ache in his stomach? Secrecy is, secrecy is increasingly important. Stakes escalating. Boaz's lips narrow. Gigantic things underway. I see we're scaling up for something, but I, I'm trying to bring you on board, Max. Make you a part of this. Boaz leans in. Just seeing if you're up to it. Again, Max wants to laugh, an urge quelled by the queasy hint of malign insanity. Every muscle tense, rigid with fear as if in response to some looming threat. With a major project underway, shouldn't we all, shouldn't we have all hands? The brightest members of my team, yes, yes, but I have to weigh risks. Boaz grips Max's shoulders. Our people, they're, they're good boys, most of them, but with the normal tendencies. His lip curls as if in suppressed revulsion to resist radically new ideas. Max nods. What to say? Acknowledging these concerns, sir, how can we ramp up, let alone service existing customers, without our human assets? Maybe he's overextending. He almost changes the subject. Newton's one of our smartest guys, and loyal. And Palomar? Boaz seizes the doorknob without turning it. They're involved. Most of them busy in the melt shop. Don't worry. We'll leverage everyone's capabilities. This new thing, it transcends business, like... Manhattan Project, or Apollo, changes everything. Boaz wipes beads of oily sweat from his hairless scalp, then rubs slippery palms together. Finally, he opens the door. Speaking of doors, I'm going to leave you with a blank screen for just a few moments. You can look at my books, but I've got a box of bubble wrap I need to go pull in. So, one sec. I'll be right back. <laughs> Still there? <laughs> All right. I have no idea if anybody's still there, so I'm going to keep going with the story. I appreciate your waiting, but it's going to take one sec because this is a long story. And, uh... All righty. Returning to his desk, Max tries to calm down. He wants to manage this, take stock of facts. What might this all mean? He keeps feeling this new way of things as something he'll never understand, that he's being left out, still oblivious, walking blindly toward... What? He wants to call Cassandra. Probably she's working. The thought makes him angry. Why should he play along with her pretense about furniture? These weird constructs of hers have nothing at all in common with the little tables and chairs she used to make. Next time this ridiculous notion of furniture comes up, he'll force the issue. What exactly are you talking about? Tables, chairs. This makes him so angry. Everything disintegrating both home and work. The walls of the cubicle constrict. Max tries to focus on routine tasks, duties which always seemed intrinsically valuable. Yesterday's priorities feel absurd, distant, faced with an office of empty desks, vacant but for a few loitering imposters. Vast overnight construction undertaken without oversight by the management team. It's too much. He's too far outside the loop to see any way back in. One terrible thought keeps looping like a broken record. Maybe I'm left out. 
Max sits at his desk, mind racing, unaware and unconcerned that he appears to be doing absolutely nothing. At that moment, someone walks past his cubicle opening, the short-sleeved man. No mistaking the burns this time, it's Max's neighbor. He passes, giving no hint of having seen Max, enters Boaz's office, and shuts the door. Max tries to stand, knees weak and almost falls. It's too much to comprehend this mystery belonging unquestionably to home, the faceless, always aware neighbor, somehow colliding with this place. The whole world's flipped. Boaz, unrecognizable. Cassandra acting like his enemy. The new neighbor shows up here. Today, of all days, heart thudding, steadying himself against the desk, Max cranes to watch through Boaz's window. The man turns, sees Max, expressionless. He flicks the blinds shut. On his way up the stairs, Max tries to fortify his resolve. When did Cassandra's lies begin? He can't remember when things changed. Lately, when their eyes meet, both of them know something's broken. Before opening the door, he pauses. The way he's always paused on his way out, he needs to confront her. Max takes measure of his emotions, too angry. Too frustrated, ready to blow, too raw, made vulnerable by his wanting. The love he still feels, though distorted and fragmented, exerts such force when he tries to deal with her, Cassandra. When he says the name, he still sees the face of the years-ago girl. Max opens the door. The apartment's quiet. No stereo blasting, no plasma sizzle, no smoke. Cassandra must be gone. He relaxes, slightly relieved then hears shuffling papers. In the living room, she's hurriedly plying design drawings. On top, she places a heavy art book. He pretends not to notice. No fires today? Smiles feebly. Before she turns away, he sees her eyes, dark circles, skin pale and transparent. Wait, Cass, we have to talk then. I'll leave you to it. Cassandra faces him, slump-shouldered. Too much to do. We can eat something if you want, maybe around nine. More than tired, she's hollowed out, just reaching for the torch, an obvious effort. Max crosses the room. No, we need to talk first. He jerks the plasma unix plug, plug from the outlet. Instantly feral, she presses up in his face. Do you realize how easily I could leave you? First he backs up, then he stops himself, exhales. I've supported your art. What you're doing affects my career. She lunges for the plug. He sidesteps to block. She turns left, reverses right, and frustration boils over. Inchoate rage finds release in a wordless scream. She throws her glove across the room, storms out, slams the door. Pulsing throb in Max's temple. Breathing hard. First time she's threatened to leave. He takes a look around, thinking it's the first time he's even been alone in their apartment, such quiet. Dust motes hover in still air. He's a stranger in his own place, an intruder. The urge to run to flee home pulls hard. Her pile of drawings are weighed down under La Pope, a book of Hans Belmer's surreal puppet photography, eroticized constructs of mismatched doll parts, inanimate sexual invitation meets body horror, Concealed under a few of Cassandra's drawings, pencil sketches of the sort of furniture she used to make, are numerous professional engineering plans not in her hand. These resemble the weird, gangling structures she's lately been assembling. The names and part numbers mean nothing to Max. One of the plans appears to dictate the assemblage of thousands of moderately sized components into an enormous whole. An overview depicts a multi-leveled structure tapering from a broad base, each ladder-like rung narrower, something like the Eiffel Tower, but vastly larger, judging by tiny human forms provided for scale. Could she really be building something? using steel Max purchased from Boaz, helping somebody assemble pieces into this sky ladder, whatever it is. What if it involves Dino Resource Group? At the top of one code-like text document, the name, Diamond Dust Project. 
a nightmare, like waking up buried under suffocating weight, too hard to breathe, one dark revelation after another, level after level of secrecy at home, at work, sickness manifesting in her eyes, Cassandra always mentioned a plan. A way out of this apartment, a better future, she never mentioned becoming a cog in some secret machine. The front door clicks, squeaks open. Max flips back the papers, replaces the Belmer puppet book, and stands away. Cassandra enters from the hallway. She looks at him, says nothing. His chance to speak. How often he, has he resolved to force some issue? Each decision to bring matters to a head trails off somehow, ends in nothing. An intolerable status quo extends on and on, his concerns swept aside whether or not he uttered them. Max wants to scream, somehow break through her impenetrability. He's part of the problem, he knows, inertia, passivity, when it comes to her at least unwillingness to cut free, even from something he is no longer sure he desires. Diamond dust. Whatever it means, the name makes him think of Diamond Dogs by David Bowie. Max finds the CD, puts it on without a glance at Cassandra. Too long she's dominated the stereo with her soundtrack for collapsing buildings. He sings the opening line, raises his fist on genocide. Cassandra crosses the room to check her piles of paper. Max sits on the charred fut futon, reading lyrics in the CD booklet. She approaches, sits beside him, and sidles up close. She keeps her palms flat on her thighs. Despite this, her version of physical affection, he senses her formulating plans from which he's excluded. A creaking ladder into a sky opaque with the blackness of soot and metal dust, Cassandra wandering, part of some industrial doomsday, himself alone in this place, ashen black, cold and still, so close. A thousand tiny scars on her face and shoulders, each a pocket of metal that burned into her and cooled beneath the skin. Such tiny disfigurements, so many in number, enlarged, in too great proximity, even the beautiful can seem ugly. All Max's friends, especially the men, everyone commented on Cassandra's beauty. Impossible to ignore. They all say that he's lucky to have someone like her. She drapes an arm across Max's shoulders, and he shudders at her emptiness. And I'll be back to it in just a sec here. I think you might be able to hear Eleanor out in the other room squeaking a toy. Okay, let's do this. That was the end of my water. So hopefully my voice holds up for uh, six pages. Ooh. The next morning, a new executive office has appeared out of nowhere beside Boaz's own, the company now two-brained in control of the cubicle-dwelling segments of his corpus. Max sees within the new office his neighbor conversing with three policemen, probably about the bodies they find every night along Lorraine Street. So many dead. No explanation. Boaz stays shut away, alone in his office, even after the police are gone. So much changed. What's the point of giving up dreams for salary if it doesn't come with some promise of security? If it can all be taken away in times of upheaval like this... All Boaz's promises, hence really, probably useless with a second boss balancing the scale. Max keeps trying to stamp out his fear before the embers ignite. Despite lacking adequate information, he remains determined to keep up the appearance of forward motion. Someone will let him know what's going on, or he'll figure it out himself. He'll get back on top. The corner cubicle. Newton's until last week is again occupied. Max has already forgotten the new guy's name. Legs asprawl on his desk, pant legs riding up to expose white skin over black socks. The man endlessly mutters into his phone, so monotone, Max doubts anyone's on the other end. Within the droning monologue, the words, Diamond Dust. Electrified, Max leaps up, 
stumbles into the next cube. He spins the man's legs off the desk and grabs him with violent urgency. Max leans in, nose to nose. What do you know about it? He mouths the words, Diamond Dust. The neutral-faced man thumbs the disconnect button. I thought you were inside. The man's lips are pale gray as she looks around. This is planning. Planning unit, right? Max nods. Boaz spoke to me yesterday. The man looks skeptical. The janitor's closet. Max whispers. Recognition. The man's face relaxes. Max takes a seat. The thing is, Dino. I thought they were the ones getting the bid on Diamond Dust. The guy inclines his head toward the new office. This new man, Fabrizio. He says Diamond Dust is so big, for the first time it's not Boaz. I mean, us versus Dino. We're in it together. Every engineering firm in town, every structural fab, every melt shop. And it's not just Portland anymore. Max still isn't sure what it is. He, want, he wants more. Something to flesh out the projection he imagines from Cassandra's plans briefly glimpsed. Boaz emerges from his office and starts toward Fabrizio's. He sees Max and stops. What you said about Newton, I've been thinking. See if you can find him on the melt floor. He's too valuable to be slinging coal or who knows what. Boaz mimes shoveling a motion which unavoidably becomes a golf swing. He gives it up. There's sense in what Boaz suggests. It's what Max wants. Why does it feel like being sent to human resources for a layoff? Passage to the melt shop is blocked by the black draped scaffold. Max finds a seam, slips through, and navigates a web of crossbars and platforms. Once beyond the layer of fireproof carbon blanketing the inner scaffold wall, a wave of fierce heat waters his eyes. Vision adjusts to a darkness mitigated only by a distant red glow. The factory he estimated doubled in size is closer to ten times larger than before. The expansion covering not just the old parking lot, but north and east as well, where days ago stood empty fields and crumbling brickworks. A space so vast, walls recede in haze like the desert horizon. Machines hum and churn, the heartbeat of mechanistic life newly birthed. The melt pool, a demonic ocean covering acres, serviced by a fleet of giant cauldrons. So unfamiliar, all this. What insight can Max offer? The perspective of decades, worthless now. Dead-eyed laborers plod step to discordant clanging. Rows of sullen hunchbacks, faces featureless, powdered black. How will he find Newton, let alone recognize him? Drifting, drawn toward the central vat as if by gravity, a seething orange lake, millions of liquid tons, a city-sized repository of thermal energy. Ordinary melt pools are terrifying enough. This is like standing near the surface of a tiny, remorseless sun. One slip and all that energy unmakes you. Fall in, leave nothing behind but a puff of ash and a tiny pocket of impurity. Soon churned away, dispersed. So easy to be. So easy to disappear. To be devoured by all this. Max has visited steel mills around the world. Twenty years. He's seen nothing like this. Too hot. Stifling wants to move closer, drawn toward an area of blinding intensity, luminescent currents swirl just below floor level. What is it? Within hypnotic patterns of yellow-hot eddies, he perceives familiar shapes, human forms, his mind reels. Yes, a pair of bodies. They swim and frolic together in molten steel. Impossible, of course it is. Max leans, grips the railing, squinting against the heat. Not just the two of them, intertwining in a fluid sort of dance, beyond others in the background, so many, all moving, unharmed. One of the pair resolves to greater solidity, a set of proportions familiar as a face. Max gasps. His heart rattles painfully in his chest. 
It's Cassandra, enfolded, writhing with another. Max wants to turn away. Even in such shock, he can't deny what he's seeing. Everything's changed. It's all unknown, not just Boaz, the factory, Cassandra. All solid ground vanished, a world of deadly fluidity. Her face rises from the glowing steel lake and turns to confront him. Any doubt erased, the second shape still touching her, Max recognizes as well. Fabrizio. It must be. Cassandra, the neighbor. The new boss. Too much. Max can't bear watching. None of this makes sense. He backs away. The Cassandra shape disentangles from Fabrizio. Her movements change from fluttering easily like a swimmer in a pool to the slower motions of struggling against resistance. She climbs, as if stepping out of thick mud. Finally, she steps free. The flow seemingly fully solid and able to support her, as if responding to her desire that it do so. Air cools her to reddish-orange, standing there atop the steel, then climbing stair-like ridges in the vat's edge. As she reaches the concrete floor, she's becoming flesh again. Fabrizio remains behind, watching nose-deep from the pool, which remains fluid for him. Cassandra approaches Max, her body evolving intermediate between steel and naked skin. You weren't, Max begins. I thought we were... Cassandra lifts her arms, demonstrating for Max her new form, unblemished white, free of the many tiny scars. She turns and glides off toward darker realms beyond the pools, motioning for Max to follow, eyes adjust, until he discerns the edge of a vacant space, a deep, cavernous pit. I saw plans in the apartment, some kind of sky ladder, he gestures, indicating uprising levels, stops abruptly when he realizes his closeness to the precipice. Cassandra stands on the verge, toes extending into emptiness. Wrong direction. She raises a thumb and points it emphatically down. Max tries to look down. Such dizziness, he almost swoons the yawning scale of the abyss. I came looking for Newton, he gasps. I don't even know how I... You've been meant for this all along. Cassandra, reve Cassandra reveals a smile he's never seen before. It's terrifying. She isn't what he thought, maybe never was. A great descent is underway, a metal latticework of trusses and beams penetrating the earth, rungs on which climbers probe the deepest dark, some of them colleagues, members of his team. Horrible, Max stammers. No, her smile broadens, disproportionate, more than ugly, monstrous, progress, culmination of our utmost destiny. Again, straining toward the threshold, Max cringes at the bottomless infinitude, desiring at once to turn away and to behold the alien construct of parts made by Cassandra and others like her, pieces interlock held in place by anthropomorphic steel fixtures. Workers swarm the metal grid, suffering at the tension, even more join the effort. Machines link in, ratchet lower, and hammer foundational stone. Diamond-tipped burrowers swarm, glistening as they spin. Fabrizio approaches from behind, slowly cooling. He stands beside Cassandra. Max feels a positive reflex. He's aware this is absurd. The boss is like you, Max, Cassandra says, always hinting, tenuous, never quite a promise, not tangible enough to grasp. That's all she's ever given. We're ready to bring you in, Max. In Fabrizio's half-metal state of flux, his speech is slurred, guttural. Just stop resisting. Do what you're told and you'll run this. Otherwise, grinning. He extends an arm in a dramatic, balletic gesture toward the pit. His skin is clean and white, free of scars. Max gives no answer. None is needed. He has no alternative. Creatures, barely human, climb slippery hot from the melt pool, pass without stopping and slither over the brink. 
each descends to an ordained position and slowly hardens in place, bound together in an agonized realm of ash and steel. Their relinquished dreams and forgotten pleasures form underpinnings of a new, transformed world. The trembling ladder vibrates amidst a head-splitting tone. This resonance harmonizes like an infernal chorus with moans of torment echoing from the deeps. Cinder plumes rise, black orchids blooming against seething red, eyes water and burn, stung by primordial dusts which swirl up from the bitter dark. Nothing to see or hear but a hellish roar, the future unknowable. Max drops to his knees, crawls blindly toward the heat. Thank you for tuning in. That was Diamond Dust by Michael Griffin from The Lure of Devouring Light. It originally appeared in the Grim Scribes Puppets. Mike's worth a read. He's got a story in Eternal Frankenstein. Um, thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. Now I'm going to go drink something for my raw, raw voice. Have a great day.